love fruit. In fact, I love everything about fruit. I love growing fruit, picking fruit, and of course, eating fruit. But while I've always enjoyed fruit, it hasn't been until recently that I've become aware of the variety and abundance of fruit growing right here in our own city. Just look at this gorgeous fruit that we can harvest from our very own backyards. How many of you have some sort of fruit growing in your backyard? How many of you are like I was and don't know whether that little red berry in the back is actually edible? <laughs> it actually took us several years to identify the fruit growing in our backyard. And to this day, our neighbors look on with suspicion and worry every time they see us picking buckets of bright red Nanking cherries. Since I began making use of our own fruit, I started noticing fruit growing everywhere. It's a little like buying your dream car. You know, a steel blue Chevy Uplander minivan. <laughs> <laughs> and then suddenly realizing there's a lot of people driving a minivan. It's like that with fruit for me. I see fruit growing everywhere. And yes, I do look upon that fruit with envy. I am guilty of coveting my neighbor's fruit. <laughs> Now, with this keen sense of fruit spying, I've also observed that there is a lot of surplus fruit in our community. I see fruit rotting on trees, making a mess on the ground, or being infested by hordes of wasps. One day, I even saw bags upon bags of big, beautiful eating apples lined up next to the garbage can, waiting to be taken to the dump. It looked like this. And I felt like this. What was previously so inconspicuous was suddenly in my face, and I couldn't understand it. How could we be letting all this nutritious, delicious, free fruit go to waste? Especially when there are people like me willing to pick that fruit. And more importantly, when there are 860,000 Canadians making use of food banks every month. It just didn't make sense. And seeing those apples headed to the dump started this nagging feeling in me that maybe I should do something about it. Three months later, I came across an article about fruit rescuing and a concept that addressed this very issue. Here's the concept. Connect homeowners with surplus fruit with volunteer fruit pickers who pick that fruit and then share it three ways. One third to the homeowner, one third to the volunteers, and one third to community groups. Isn't that a brilliant idea? I certainly thought so, and I could see how this would work in my neighborhood. So what do you do? You clearly have a passion for something. You've identified a problem. And now there's a solution in your hand. What would you do? Well, like a lot of us would, I tried to pawn the idea off on others. <laughs> Certain that one of those community groups out there already working in food initiatives would be willing and appreciative of such a wonderful idea. And they did love the idea. But unfortunately, they weren't able or willing to take it on at the time. And time was ticking. Already, the blossoms were bursting with color on the trees, and I had visions of more apples headed to the dump. I had a choice to make. I could follow my passion and do something about it, or I could follow a more secure and stable path and let others deal with the issue. I turned to my friends and family for their thoughts. My husband, a brilliant ideas man himself, was very supportive and encouraging. 
although he was a little concerned that he might be the only volunteer <laughs> helping to pick apples all summer. My friends were also very supportive, although they did politely point out that a full-time job might be less time-consuming and more financially rewarding. And while I know that's true, <laughs> I also knew that I couldn't let it go. And so with the help and support of those friends and family members and those community groups who were excited about the idea, I started Fruit Share in my neighborhood. And it started quite simply with coming up with a couple of forms, talking to existing fruit rescuing organizations, writing some articles, sending out some press releases, and starting a blog announcing, Fruit Share is open for business. I had no idea what that would look like, but it was open. On May 22, 2010, Fruit Share got its first call from a homeowner. All right, between you and me, it was my friend Julie who was calling to see if I wanted some of her rhubarb. I jumped at the chance, and that day I harvested three pounds of rhubarb. And I thought, OMG, <laughs> what have I done? What possible impact could three pounds of rhubarb split three ways have? <laughs> But I had come this far, and so I decided to tie a little ribbon around it, attach a note about fruit chair, and went to the seniors' apartment building at the end of our street. I was greeted by an elderly gentleman who welcomed me in and patiently listened to the story of fruit chair. I, in turn, listened to his story as he described how every spring he would go to his backyard, harvest his rhubarb, and make rhubarb crisp for his wife. It had been several years since they moved away from that backyard. And he smiled as he looked at the rhubarb and asked, you wouldn't mind if I used that rhubarb to make rhubarb crisp for my wife tonight. Wow. Apparently, three pounds of rhubarb can have an impact. After that day, I was hooked. And throughout the rest of the summer, I met a lot more fabulous people, volunteers and homeowners. Homeowners like 82-year-old Kathleen. Kathleen welcomed us into her home and told us about her two apple trees. Apple trees that were planted by her sons on consecutive Mother's Days many years ago. She loved those apples and all that they represented to her and didn't want to see them go to waste. On the other hand, there's homeowners like 20-year-old John, who's a workaholic and has neither time nor interest in his apples. John thanked us profusely for alleviating what he calls his apple tree guilt. In fact, John really didn't want his apples, and so he graciously donated his third to our volunteers and community groups, a practice that many of our homeowners opt for. Our volunteers are just as diverse. Take Ellen, for example, a retired school teacher who recently moved from the farm to the city. Ellen and her sister Lydia know how to can and jam just about anything. They shared one of her favorites with me, crabby elder jelly. <laughs> that same spirit and enthusiasm is repeated in many of our volunteers who has made Fruit Chair a success and enabled us to collect 1,600 pounds of fruit that first year. We were getting calls from all over the city and it was clear that Fruit Chair needed to expand. And expand we did. In 2011, our second year, we harvested enough fruit to share with 19 different community groups. Our numbers went through the roof. We grew from 10 to 200 volunteers in approximately four to five months, a 2,000% increase. Our number of harvests went from 20 to 97, and the pounds of fruit harvested went from 1,600 to 7,386 pounds. Wow. wow. If you went to the store today to purchase that fruit, 
you'd be shelling out $15,000 to $20,000. By all indications, food share is a success. And I know the dedicated team of volunteers that have come together will ensure that we will harvest and rescue more fruit for many years to come. Now, it may sound like fruit share is just a story about fruit, but I have experienced that it is about so much more than just fruit. So what makes fruit share successful? I believe that fruit share is successful because it is based on the premise of sharing, specifically sharing surplus. Sharing items that we have in quantities that are beyond what we need and want. Items that are underused, undervalued, or simply wasted. By sharing our surplus, not only are we making effective use of those wasted items, but we are able to give people the opportunity to experience what it feels like when we contribute to our society. And that's a feeling worth having. And I'm so grateful that my family has had that opportunity. I remember the first time we got in our van and delivered a big box of rhubarb to Silo Mission. Now, our family is a pretty loud and boisterous family, and when we get in that Chevy Uplander, it's loud, and there's a lot of chit-chatting going on. And there was that evening as well, until we caught sight of the mission. When we saw 60 to 75 homeless people lined up for a bed and a meal, a line that wrapped around the building, everyone was silent. We were all experiencing and understanding that this was so much bigger than the box of rhubarb. I was grateful that day for us and our children to have the opportunity to experience what it feels like to be part of community. And that's the feeling that on an event like today, I wonder, what if? What if we had the opportunity to apply that formula elsewhere? What if we had a formula from Fruit Share? What if that formula were Share X, where X is any surplus item, and Share is the system that enables that sharing to happen? Can Share X apply to things other than fruit or zucchini? <laughs> yes, absolutely. In fact, it's already happening. There's just a couple of organizations who are already doing this. Arts Junction collects business byproducts, misprints and overruns, and shares them with artists, school teachers, and the general public. Garden Share is where sunny backyards are being shared with gardeners who in turn share their produce. Car sharing is where multiple families are coming together to share their car. And Global Links is a bigger organization in the U.S. that collects surplus medical supplies and shares them with developing countries who desperately need those supplies. They're making it happen. And you and I, we may not be ready to share our uplanders or our backyards, but we need to think, what could I share? What can I apply? to the ShareX model. When I look at the world, I see fruit. Fruit is my X. The challenge for all of you is to look at your world and to discover what is your X. Thank you.